thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Lou Purvis and I'm a member of the support team at the BMW Equine Hospital in Gloucestershire. Um, and I'm delighted that Veronica uh, is joining us and presenting this webinar about head shaking this evening. Um, I'm sure that many of you will have heard of Veronica, but just to give you some background, she's considered um, one of the, if not the uh, world's leading expert in terms of research and knowledge into uh, trigeminal mediated head shaking in horses. Um, her research into head shaking has won several awards and Veronica was recently awarded a PhD by publication into um, trigeminal mediated head shaking. So well done for that. Um, she frequently presents at international conferences and consults on head shaking cases from all over the globe and has published several peer reviewed papers, uh, as well as numerous book chapters and magazine articles. Um, and her work has led to the use of Equipens treatment for uh, trigeminal mediated head shakers. And just to let you know that Veronica's passion for horses goes beyond her veterinary work. Um, you've also completed an advanced medium in dressage, I understand, and uh, trained your own horses. Um, so Veronica has a huge amount of knowledge on the subject, uh, which we're going to delve into this evening, uh, although we'll probably only manage to scratch the surface surface of this uh, huge topic. Um, if you've got any questions, if you could submit them via the Q&A button on your uh, Zoom screens there, and um, I'll put them to Veronica at the end of the presentation. Um, just to let you know, the webinar is being recorded and will be available in a few days on the BMW YouTube channel. So you keep an eye on our Facebook page for a link. Um, Ronnie has also recorded a couple of more detailed video video presentations about the investigation and management of head shakers. And those are also on our YouTube channel um, after this evening. Um, and finally, before I pass over, um, just to let you know that Veronica with her, within her university role um, is available at the BMW Equine Hospital for the investigation and treatment of head shakers. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Veronica and we'll make a start. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Lee, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for attending today. Um, I've, I've done a few webinars recently and actually, you know, kind of February time, maybe December, uh, no one actually had anything better to do. Um, but I appreciate actually that, that tonight you do have something better to do or maybe you don't if you have a family of football fans and you're trying to hide. Um, but um, I do appreciate you coming. So thank you for that. So this is my favourite um, webinar related slide, um, just makes me laugh every time. So what are we going to cover this evening? And, and as Lou said, we are going to be scratching the surface, but we're going to try and cover it as, as best we can in the time. So we're going to look at what is trigeminal mediated head shaking, why do horses get it, who's affected, how to make a diagnosis, what to do if your horse starts head shaking and how you can help. There's a lot we don't know yet. Um, and as I said, we, we are just going to cover major points and there's a lot more detail available on our website. And there is also a lot more detail out there um, that, that you might want to ask about um, particular, particular things. And I put some, some references in which you may want to ask more detail about as well. So what's trigeminal mediated head shaking? Well, as you know, it is perfectly normal for a horse to shake its head. That's fine, that's what horses do. And there's loads of reasons why a horse will shake its head. Um, whether that shaking be normal or, or abnormal, there's lots and lots of different reasons. But in how many horses does shaking become a problem? So how common is head shaking enough to be a problem? And then that's a question that I wanted to answer. So um, we, we did this research with my um, student, Sarah Ross, postgraduate student, she's now a medicine specialist um, herself, and we found out that 4.6% of the UK equine population are considered to shake their heads more than is normal. That's about 44,000 horses in the UK, so that's an awful lot. Um, and just to give you an idea of how common that is compared to other diseases, um, about 8% of horses get laminitis. So it's Actually, it's really common, isn't it? Because we all know, I mean, a lot of you here tonight will know a horse that shakes its head because that's why you're here. But if you're just here because you're interested, you'll certainly know um, the number of horses. You know, you, you know, you'll know other horses 
friends and horses with laminitis, hopefully not your own. Um, it's pretty common and surprising. So it's surprising that it's so common for something we actually know so little about. Now, of that 4.6%, um, how many horses head shake due to trigeminal neuropathy? Now, the only number I've got is about 90%, but that's not really out of the 4.6%. That's out of the number of horses that are referred to a hospital for investigation. So they will already have been assessed by their owner. They will have been assessed by their trainer. They'll have been assessed by their vet at home. They'll probably have um, spoken to a referral vet. Um, if it's me, I tend to watch videos before they come. And it's only then when they come to the hospital that we then diagnose 90% with trigeminal neuropathy. So actually, of your 4.6%, it is not 90% of those um, that are trigeminal mediated head shakers. It is important to consider all possible diagnoses, but it's actually the biggest cause of head shaking is trigeminal mediated um, neuropathy. And we will talk about what that means. So horses with trigeminal mediated head shaking tend to have very, very classic signs. Not all of them, but the vast majority pretty much look the same. And they will vary within themselves day on day, um, season on season, potentially, um, moment to moment. But they do, if, when you look at them as an overall, they tend to look the same. So how do they look? They have predominantly vertical head shaking. It's accompanied by sharp vertical twitches and flicks. Nasal irritation, they snort, they twitch their lips, they rub their nose, they strike at their nose, and it's both sides. And I'm going to show you a few videos. And for those of you who may unfortunately be here because you think your horse has trigeminal mediated head shaking, or he's been diagnosed, or he or she has been diagnosed as trigeminal mediated, I think you're likely to watch the videos and go, Oh, I recognize that. Actually, if you watch the videos, your oh, my horse doesn't do that, that's probably good because hopefully they're not trigeminal mediated. They're worse at exercise and crucially any exercise. And so if they only do it ridden and not on the lunge, you're dealing with something else. Some of them are actually so bad they can be affected at rest as well. Some are seasonally affected and if so, they're usually worse in the spring and summer. Now the number there is massive, isn't it? A quarter seasonally affected to nearly three quarters seasonally affected. And actually, if you look at the research behind that, that comes down to the question that's asked. So, the question for the 64% that was asked was, is your horse a lot better in the winter? Of which 64% said yes. My question, which came up with 25%, was, is your horse completely better in the winter? Because actually, as far as I'm concerned, if your horse is still head shaking, it's not better. Um, it, I want to know if they're completely better in the winter. So 25% to 64%, depending on the question that's asked, are better or at least improved part of the year. Again, some of you may have seen this, some are only affected when exercised outdoors, not indoors. Some of them are worse out hacking near trees, uh, near rape is another one that we see, um, near hedges. So something is going on with the world. Here we are with our videos. Hopefully those are playing it okay. Classic signs, so vertical head shaking. I've got this on, on mute um, because otherwise it gets sort of too much background noise, but he's snorting and sneezing. Um, and he's a he's a nice horse and he's a pretty unhappy chap. And another one, and he, I know he's on a hillside, um, but he's actually very similar, isn't he? He's very upset. So here we are out riding. This is another beautiful horse, and he's he's really in trouble. Um, I mean, we you know people used to think this was was bad behaviour, and this is a this is a nice horse. He's got no reason to be behaving badly. He is not behaving badly. And this one, um, this was a, a really lovely actually top show jumper who I saw over in Sweden, and she couldn't even leave her stable. And to be fair, couldn't even stay in her stable. Look at her, um, her there in the stable. That's that's terrible, isn't it? Um, no relief for her. So as I said, think if not classic. Look at this horse. This is a nice young inventor, a competent professional, very competent professional rider. Vertical head shaking when she's ridden. No snorting or sneezing. 
watcher on the lunge. No head shaking. And we did this repeatedly. So um, we asked the rider to get on and the horse would head shake and she got off and the horse stopped head shaking. And obviously you then think to yourself, well, it's a, it's a rider problem. But actually in, the, in this case, there's no way this is the rider not riding well enough to call, you know, causing a problem. She rides extremely nicely. Um, this actually, this horse actually turned out to have an orthopedic problem and it was just upset. And that was her way of expressing it. Um, so doing quite a lot of background on your horse is really, really helpful. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. This one, vertical head shaking, twitching, rubs the nose. Well, what do you notice? He only rubs one side and um, I can play him again. He's actually rubbed that left side completely raw and the right side's fine. So this horse doesn't have trigeminal mediated head shaking. What this guy actually had was damage to a tooth that had set up an infection. Now, normally a tooth infection doesn't cause this. And they'll, you, you've seen it, haven't you? They, they, they drop their food and little balls on the floor and then they, they're not very happy. Or, or, or maybe you know nothing and they just smell um, when they breathe on you. Um, and, and otherwise they seem fine. But what had happened with him was this infection had damaged the bone that protects the nerve, this trigeminal nerve or a branch of the trigeminal nerve in the face. And I will talk a bit more about nerve branches later. Um, and so it set up nerve damage and this horse is showing nerve pain. But he's not got trigeminal mediated head shake. You can fix him if you can fix his tooth. So what do we know about trigeminal mediated head shake? Well, I put up this little um, diagram because it's quite useful and I've just been talking about nerve branches, haven't I? So the trigeminal nerve runs from the horse's face to the horse's brain and back again. What we're looking at is the three branches that we've got. So we've got one that goes to the eyes, one that goes to the lower jaw, and then the yellow one is the one that we are predominantly dealing with in the vast majority of cases of trigeminal mediated head shaking. And this one runs to the nose, inside the nose, the face. It's all about sensation. It tells the brain what it's feeling. It's a very big nerve. It's got lots of little sub branches off it. And as you can see, it tunnels through the horse's skull as well. So there's a whole area of it that we actually can't even get to, um, to, to, to look at or do anything with. So that's our anatomy. And what do we know about this nerve? In trigeminal mediated head shakers, this nerve branch, the yellow one, has become sensitized. And that means it fires at a threshold 10 times lower than normal. So if you look at your hand at the moment, um, your hand is covered in bacteria, and fortunately, you can't feel them crawling about. Um, but if you tap your hand with your finger, you can feel that, can't you? And that's because the sensory nerve to your hand knows when it's something that's worth telling your brain about. And you have to tap at a, you know, above a certain um, level of, of strength, if you like, before that nerve goes, oh, yeah, go on, I'm going to tell the brain about it. It's that thing, the threshold, that is 10 times lower than normal in these horses. So their nerve is massively sensitive. If your nerve is massively sensitive, you can experience neuropathic pain. What is neuropathic pain? Well, in people, um, anything from pins and needles, all the way up to burning and electric shock-like pain. And that can vary day on day, moment on moment. Um, and I unfortunately, um, as many of you will have done as well, um, fell, <laughs> fell off my youngster um, and broke my leg very, very badly. Um, whoopsie. I uh, also broke my saddle with my leg, which really annoyed me. But that's another story. So as my leg was healing, I experienced really severe neuropathic pain for several months. And actually, even now I've got nerve damage and it's very sensitive. So if I catch my calf on the uh, coffee table sort of thing um if i catch my right leg it's fine if i catch my left leg it's it's cripplingly painful so but these horses have this in their face all the time um and it was certainly a very interesting learning experience to experience neuropathic pain um to make me empathize with my patients or although i would rather have not broken the leg in the first place there is no physical damage to the nerve 
so some very kind owners um, that I had working at when I was working at Bristol um, in the hospital there, their horses weren't responding to any treatment and were suffering and had to be euthanized due to head shaking. And we were given their nerves to look at by the owners. And I'm very grateful to that. And we for them and, and, and we looked at those nerves under the microscope with a veterinary pathologist and with some of the team um, over at Southmead who do human um, neuro, neurophysiology and neuropathology, and they were amazing. Um, there's no physical damage to the nerve. So we can't find any loss of myelin sheath. There's no big hole. Um, there's nothing wrong with the nerve when you look at it. That was perhaps not necessarily what we expected. Um, and in a bit frustrating, because you end up going, <laughs> but, Actually, that's better because, well, you know, nerve damage doesn't do well. Um, if it did, people would do fine if they had spinal cord injuries rather than end up tetraplegic or whatever. So it's actually much better that I don't look at you and go, oh, yeah, this has happened to the nerves and nothing we could do. Um, it does mean it might be reversible. And then you look at the horses and you go, well, some of them are seasonal. And, and so there's got to be some degree of, of reversibility. Um, and the nerve, we think, fires normally when they are out of season, if they are completely um, free of head shaking signs, but that's only been tested in one horse. And 5% of trigeminal mediated head shakers, just as they wake up one day with head shaking, wake up one day without head shaking. Um, some of them will get better slower, some of them will start head shaking slower, but we're looking at about a 5% spontaneous remission. What don't we know? <laughs> a lot. Uh, we don't know why. We don't know how. We don't know who. A switch has been flicked to make this threshold come down and the nerve be sensitive, but we don't know what the switch is. We don't know how it's flicked. We don't know why it's flicked and we don't know how to flick it back. Are all horses sensitized? Pro probably. Um, it's only been published in a handful of horses. Um, but there's been some work over in Germany, which hasn't yet been published, but looks at, at a couple of hundred horses and they do all seem to be sensitized. So I think that is likely to be to be the case. Why is it just that nerve? If you look at conditions in people where there's no physical damage to the nerve, if you look at it under a microscope, they are sensitized everywhere and they're usually born like it. There is something about the environment. And those of you with experience of head shaking will know that. Um, some of them will only do it outside. Some of them do it after they've recently moved house. But if you move them back, they carry on head shaking. Um, there's something. And they're not born like it. They develop head shaking. But they could live with another horse that's had exactly the same experiences and exposures. And that horse doesn't start to head shake. It's not allergy. If you treat them with steroid, which is your top allergy treatment, they don't get better. So there, but there is something, and I do have a few ideas as to, to what we can look into, but um, that's definitely for another day. But we don't know any answers. So there is a lot more work to be done. Who's affected? Well, we think it's worldwide. Is it developed countries? Is that just because they're the only people who report it? Certainly, I have colleagues who work with working horse populations and they haven't seen it. But is that because most of them work and walk? Um, is that because uh, and they don't tend to shake so much in walk, although some horses would still do that? Um, is that because they have a different diet? Is that have different management? What about competition horses living in those countries? Um, I don't know the answers. And actually finding out some of those answers might give us a clue as to what it is in the environment. Um, but I don't know those answers. Acquired as a young adult. So your average age of it starting is six, but there is a really wide range. So down, I've, I've got horses from a year up to 17 um, for their onset of shaking. But most of them are around about, the, about, about your sort of heartbreaking prime of your life age. Any breed, any use. Now, there's no evidence of direct heritability, so that you know one particular stallion and their combination doesn't seem to produce a line of head shakers. Um, but there's no specific studies, and I would certainly not stop anybody breeding from a head shaker because it is uh, well as long as long as the horse wasn't head shaking at rest and could be retired to breed um, without discomfort. But there is 
probably something in a horse's genetics that combines with something in the environment and you need a degree of bad luck in there as well but we don't know what that is so a lot of work to do there and I think considering the unknown environmental interaction but again that's an area that I'm hoping to be able to look into. So how do we make a diagnosis of trigeminal mediated head shaking? We've already said there's lots of other reasons that your horse head shakes. And actually, almost all those reasons are as well better, really. Um, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So there is no test for trigeminal mediated head shaking at the moment. And that does mean we're likely to overdiagnose. And the first research that was published, which came out from Bristol, was um, found that 98% of horses going to a hospital for head shaking investigation got this diagnosis. And as I've said to you earlier, we are now on about 90% as we get better tests. But probably the real number is a little bit lower. So it's still only exclusion. Potentially there's a role for these somatosensory evoked potential. So testing whether or not the horse is nervous sensitized and that might become part of our investigation. It isn't at the moment. Um, but it is something that I'd like to investigate. Now, the main challenge is it's done under general anesthesia. Can it be done understanding sedation? That would make everything much more doable. I don't know. I'm hoping to be able to find that out. So the question I get quite often is, is it worth making a diagnosis? So you sat there, you've seen the videos of the other head shakers. You're like, yeah, my horse has read the book. Um, am I better to spend my money on treatment than on diagnostics to tell me what I know already? Because actually diagnostics are inexpensive you know but this is a, a diagnosis of exclusion and we have to do ct scans and all sorts of stuff which are, is expensive almost any diagnosis is better so take the 10 percent chance one of the things that derek Nottenbelt, when i worked with him said to me which has really sort of struck a chord is that you need a diagnosis because for any condition because the most expensive treatment you'll use is the one that doesn't work and the treatment that's most likely to not work is the one for a different diagnosis. So although treatment for head shaking is not very good for trigeminal mediated head shaking, let's be as sure as we can be that we are chasing the right diagnosis with the, the, the best treatment that we can. So the 10% chance is actually probably greater in the general population. There is a massive increase in awareness of the condition amongst owners, and that's fantastic because it is not very long ago that we had to argue about it um, not being a, a behavioural problem, naughty horses, and you know, insurance companies didn't used to pay for this. And um, you know, I've certainly been responsible for sending videos um, to insurance companies uh, in, in and to change whole country policies on in, of insurance on head shaking. So um, it's really good that we're more aware, but it can lead to an overdiagnosis. Be very wary of what you read on the internet. You will read it, and that's fine, but just keep an open mind. Um, there is a little bit of um, sort of just maybe worry, I think, that, that means people think their horse might have this when it, when it, when they don't. So when it would be much better if they didn't, if they didn't have it. So how do we make a diagnosis? So talking to the owner and looking at the horse, those are by far the most important things to do. And as I said, think very hard if they've not read the book. So if they have read the book, Unfortunately, you're very likely to have a trigeminal mediated head shaker. If they haven't read the book, you're quite unlikely. You might still get that diagnosis, but you're much less likely to get there, much, much, much less. So here is another classic one. And as I said, they, they look like this. We'll find out the horse's age, breed, use, all of that sort of thing when shaking occurs. So they are, they should shake if they have trigeminal mediated head shaking. They should shake when they're ridden. They should shake when they're lunged. They should shake free schooled. Fewer of them will shake in the paddock, but if they do forced exercise in the paddock, so free schooling, then they should shake. Character of shaking. So you've seen it now, vertical, um, with the involvement of the nose. If they're going side to side, just shaking their ears. Um, they're not snorting and sneezing. They probably have something else. Let's hope so. Some of them will have had butte um, or similar at home and, and seen if that makes them better. Now, neuropathic pain, rather frustratingly, does not respond to normal painkillers. So if your horse is better on butte, yay, um, he probably doesn't have neuropathic pain. He's got something else. 
response to steroids. So some horses, particularly snorty, sneezy ones, runny noses, could they be allergic? Try them on steroids. Um, that can be inhaled um, or, or could be systemic if that's if that's easier, but see if they are better. And that may be something to try. If they respond to steroid, they are unlikely to have trigeminal mediated head shaking. What about response to a nose net? Owners know to try one. Um, that's not, not a surprise that owners try that. Um, but um, oh, sorry about that. Um, they respond to a nose net. That's not a surprise to owners to try that. But um, not all trigeminal mediated head shakers respond to it. What happens is about 25% of all horses, and I will tell you more about this, but 25% of trigeminal mediated head shakers are up to 70% better with a nose net on. But 75% of your trigeminal mediated head shakers are no better. But if you are better with a nose net, you probably are trigeminal mediated. So I grade them, and that's it's particularly useful to help make an insurance decision, to be honest, um, and to work out whether they're really better. So naught out of three is no head shaking. That's obviously not uh, the case for these horses. One out of three head shaking exercise, but manageable. And you'll get horses like that. And actually, I mean, if you go to any competition, you'll see horses with nose nets on. But you'll also see the odd one that just has a little tick, a little nose twitch. Is that a horse with very mild trigeminal mediated head shaking? That's never a problem. Could be. Two out of three, a head shaking exercise, making the horse impossible or dangerous to ride. And three out of three, head shaking even at rest. And that's really relevant because if you end up in a situation where your horse is head shaking even at rest and does not respond to treatment, then usually the best advice, unfortunately, is euthanasia on humane grounds because they have no relief from their suffering. One question that we may or may not um, seek to answer during an investigation is whether or not the head shaking is due to face pain. And you all know from orthopedic investigation that nerve blocks are great. You can put a nerve block in and put it in different places and then you eventually work out where the source of the lameness is in. And you can do that with trigeminal mediated head shakers as well. And you can put local anesthetic around the nerve and see if they stop head shaking and that is pretty useful um, but it's not it's a difficult one it's a difficult one so why is it difficult because if they stop head shaking it with the nerve block it'll last an hour and a half or so with the local anesthetic there if they stop head shaking that confirms facial pain it doesn't show why so you still got to do all your other tests um ct scans and what have you but a negative result doesn't rule it out and that's the big challenge so if they don't stop head shaking you are no further forward you can't say oh it's not face pain there's lots of reasons for that one is his experience of the technique and um, again some work that we published in 2015 we looked at how good people were um, at getting the right place with their needle um, compared to how experienced they were in doing this um, and I was in the right place about 80 percent of the time but the, the, I'm not in real life. So these, these horses, we, we did this on horses post-euthanasia um, and then we CT'd them. So my post-euthanasia horses were very still. Um, obviously, they weren't euthanized for this project. <laughs> um, they were, were given to us for um, research purposes. Um, and, and I think that's actually that's a good thing. Um, so this is something, some good to come out of a horse's death um, is, is that we can do this sort of thing and, and, and help, help move things forward. Um, but I was in the right place about 80 percent of the time. People who were not very experienced were in the right place between five and 20 percent of the time. Um, and as in that's on horses who aren't moving. So it, it's much harder in, in real life. So we don't always do this test um, because we don't always get a very useful result. Um, and it's, it's certainly not risk free. We also found that you can reach your diagnosis by other routes. Um, and if you're confident of your diagnosis, then response to a nerve block doesn't predict treatment outcome. And I wanted to know well, if, if they respond to a nerve block, are they likely to do better? No, they're not. So you don't need to do the nerve block to find out if they're going to respond to treatment. You need to do the nerve block to be sure of your diagnosis. If you're sure by other means, you may not need to do it. So when do we do it? So they've got to be head shaking consistently. Otherwise, you don't know if it's worked or not. It's got to be quite bad. It's got to be an exercise, which is much easier to evaluate. And maybe you're not sure. You know, maybe the horse is a bit old. Maybe the shaking's not completely classic. 
maybe they're also lame and you need to rule that out as being part of the problem. Um, you're aware of the limitations, so it might not give you the answer. And there are a few risks which we would talk through at the time, um, which largely you get very minor complications. Almost all of them will get a bit of a sweaty face or a bit of a droopy eye that lasts an hour and a half or so and wears off. But there are bigger risks. They haven't happened to me, but that's always a yet, unfortunately, in medicine. So here is one very lovely horse having this done. Look away if you don't like long needles. Um, the nerve is buried right deep in the horse's head. We have got local anaesthetic under the skin, so um, he actually doesn't feel the massive needle going in per se, but they do feel pressure, as you know, if you've been to the dentist. Um, we take the stylet out and inject the local anaesthetic. I'll tell you when you can look again if you're not looking for needles. We did some, some work on um, head shaking for BBC, um, the BBC Two, I think it was, and, um, and, and they filmed this and then they, they got axed by the editors. They said, oh, too many people couldn't watch the needle. Um, so this is another classic trigeminal mediated head shaker. And here he is after his nerve block. So he stops head shaking when he can't feel his face. Um, and he stops head shaking, it lasts about an hour and a half before it comes back. But we knew for sure this horse shakes because his face hurts. We don't know why his face hurts at this stage, but we know we are concentrating all our investigations on his face. So where the nerve block works, it's really useful, but I think you just gotta be aware it might not work and you might decide not to do it, um, depending on the individual case. And when the horses come into me, we always just talk about that with the owner and make a decision together. What else do we do? When you've got either head shaking due to face pain, you've either proved it or suspected it, you've got to go finding, you've got to go looking for any gross pathology. And sometimes you find it. And it's better now. We've had CT in existence for several years in horses now, but we're still talking kind of less than 10. Um, to start with, we kept finding all kinds of things which were normal, but we'd never seen them before. Um, and now we know an awful lot more, but you will definitely find abnormalities if you look hard enough and you've got to then decide whether they're likely to be relevant or not. Um, but if you find someone you're not sure whether they're relevant or not, you might need to treat them and see if they are the cause. And you eventually may reach a diagnosis of trigeminal mediated head shaking. What other diagnostics do you do? So clinical exam, and sometimes you'll find they've got a stiff neck or something like that. You might go and do a bunch of other tests. We'll always look um, up the noses and in the guttural pouch um, with an endoscope. We'll check the eyes. We'll check the mouth with an oroscope. We do a CT scan and we take blood and urine. Now, I've put a question mark there. There's a lack of knowledge for what to do with that information. We have got a little bit of knowledge there. Um, and the only way to get more knowledge is to get more data on more head shakers and see if anything comes up. Um, but we can't just do that. We can't just randomly take blood from head shakers that we're not allowed to do that. We can only do it if we're looking for a specific thing. And we are now looking for a specific problem in the blood and the urine, but we may not um, always find it. And I don't know the answer yet, but I think that is now part of our standard investigation. And obviously, if we find a problem um, in the blood or the urine, then we know um, how to address that. Um, but we, we don't know how often we'll find that, that problem. So that's a couple of ophthalmologists checking eyes for us. Um, and here is looking in the mouth with an oroscope, which is, is that step much sort of better than looking in the mouth with a, with a dental mirror, which most horses will have had uh, and very thoroughly usually, um, but looking in with an oroscope and then having a dental specialist at least review the images is um, part of our plan. And then for those of you who haven't seen a horse having a head CT, um, it's pretty amazing um, because it's just a human machine um, and you, you put the horse up on a little platform on air um, and put their head through the donut um, and take the images. And um, it actually it scans in 60 seconds. It's truly incredible, but um, which makes it sound really easy. Uh, but you spend the, the remaining um, half an hour to an hour faffing about trying to get everything perfect and, and have the horse not spooked um, in the machine. So um, they are quite technically challenging to do, but you do get some amazing images and the vast majority of horses um, tolerate it extremely well, which again, is some work that we have published. So here is a rather lovely gray mare of ours who was having his scan. So just put a little case in here. Um, this was a, a very nice um, mare called Dublin. Um, she had a gradual onset of head shaking at 14. It's a little bit old, right? Vertical head shaking, no nasal irritation, 
Um, took a little while to get going, but that's not unusual, is it, for trigeminal mediated head shake, as those of you who have experience of it. And the owners didn't lunge, so we, we didn't know. They, they just, she was a hacking horse and they rode her at hacking, and that was the facilities they had. So we didn't know if she did it not ridden. Um, so we, I watched a whole bunch of videos of her and I just wasn't sure. We lunged her in the hospital, she didn't head shake, but they don't all head shake when they come to a new environment. Um, and there's, I have a, a number of theories for that. Now, if you keep them in the hospital for a few days, they'll start head shaking. So it's not a cure, but um, but it's not uncommon that they don't head shake when they come to hospital to start with. So I sort of said to him, well, I think it could be, but um, she's not completely classic. So no nasal irritation. It came on gradually, which is not impossible, but it is less common than acute. So again, people who develop um, neuropathic facial pain syndromes tend to just be suddenly one day, bang, it comes along. And, and often people report that with trigeminal mediated head shakers. They'll say, well, I think a bee flew up his nose out hacking and he was never the same since. And actually that's just bang, suddenly one day, the trigeminal mediated head shake comes along. 14 is a bit old, but it's not impossible. And maybe she had been better on butte, but they weren't sort of confident enough to know they hadn't tried it for long enough. Um, so we were still coming and ahhing as to where we were with a diagnosis. But while we were chatting, the owner said that she'd bought the horse four years ago, at which point um, she was passported as a 10 year old, but that she'd only been passported a couple of weeks before they bought her. And they were therefore aware that she might have been a little bit older than 10 when they bought her. So she might now be a little bit older than 14. So when we looked in her mouth, we thought, oh, actually, she's probably 18 plus, possibly 20, although there's a lot of variation between her horse's mare's age. We did the CT scan, and as you can see on that image, she's got very, very small teeth, and they are much longer in younger horses. So again, there's variation, but we did have enough suspicion to think she might be older still, which would then really make trigeminal mediated head shaking unusual. Now, this is a scan um, through the through the nose. You can see the, the, the sort of black bits at the top of uh, air in the nose. And as we went back through the images, we got um, further towards the back of her head. And this is where her um, part of her temporohyoid um, apparatus, which hangs her tongue from her skull. So what you're looking at in the middle there is her little brain. And then you can see her ear canals, um, which are the black gaps at the side. Uh, and then the little green arrows just below those are her temporal hyoid joints, which should be beautifully clean and slim. Um, and these were big and lumpy and angry. And there was all sorts going on. And there's there's lots of things that can cause that. It's normally some kind of trauma where the tongue has been caught somewhere and the horse is pulled back. Um, potentially, if somebody decides to um, ill-advisedly restrain a horse by the tongue and holds onto the tongue and the horse runs backwards, um, that is something that can cause it. So this horse had terrible um, arthritis in, in this joint. And we thought, well, this, I think, is why she starts to shake her head 20 minutes into exercise. So at this point, we had two options. One was to try painkillers um, and the other was to operate. And we, we weren't sure about painkillers. We said, look, let's try the painkillers. If that doesn't work, we'll operate. Um, and actually, she's done really, really well just on, on the painkillers and hasn't needed an operation. So that's her. That, that's where it's worth looking for something else. So the harder bit, how to manage trigeminal mediated head shaking, not easy. So neuropathic pain is very difficult to manage. Neuropathic pain in people is really hard to manage. The best published treatment for neuropathic pain in people is cognitive behavioral therapy, where they teach you to cope better with your pain. Um, great. Quite frankly, I wanted some kind of treatment for mine um, beyond just learning to live with it. So that's really difficult so we're not very good at doing something in people we're going to be largely we're going to be worse in horses we don't understand why the nerve gets sensitized we don't understand how that happens to bring on the head shaking there might be more than one cause so in some horses it might be something different to other horses and if that's the case we may have to have different treatments for different individuals how are we going to find that out um, and although they often have classic signs, individuals will certainly vary on how they respond to treatment, which again is the, is the case in human um, neuro patients. So very, we're in a very difficult situation here. Um, and it would be easy to say, well, we just can't treat them. We need to find out the cause. And you're right, we do. But in the meantime, we've got horses suffering. We've got to try something while we're also trying to find a cause. Now, I can't cover all the treatments because you'll be here forever. Um, 
So I'm just going to look at treatments with some proven efficacy. There is a bit more detail in our website webinars. And I think just be aware there's an awful lot out there on the internet, but it's often not proven to, to work. Um, it may work for an individual horse, um, but not proven to work generally. So um, be wary of what you read. Now, any proven head shaking treatment does actually seem to work by reducing sensory input from the trigeminal nerve. And that's even before we knew about sensitization, which we've not known about for very long at all. So what are our treatments with some proven efficacy? So we've talked a little bit about nose nets already. First treatment to try, you don't need to see a vet, off you go and try it. Um, cheap, non-invasive, risk-free. You can compete at most levels in most disciplines and all. Um, up to 70% relief in 25% of cases. Now, sadly, if you are a bad head shaker, 70% relief, it may not be enough. If you're a good dressage horse, 70% relief may not be enough. So again, your 25% may be a little bit lower. It depends on the individual. How does it work? Gate control theory. What is gate control theory? You bang your elbow. The first thing you do is you rub it and it feels better. And if you have small children, you spend a lot of time rubbing things better and rubbing knees better and kissing foreheads and all of that kind of stuff. And that's gate control theory. And I can bore you for ages on how that is thought to work. But um, that's your take home message. That's how the, the net is working. We used to think it's not pollen going up the nose. No, it doesn't. Or we'd all be walking around with nose nets on for our hay fever. Um, no, we aren't. And in fact, anyone who's suffered hay fever with a you know COVID related mask now will know that it's a significantly unpleasant experience um, to have a runny nose with a, a proper a proper nose net mask on. Um, so it's not that. It's rubbing the nerve all the time and basically telling it what's a normal sensation. So that's how the nose net works. In some horses, they'll actually get worse. So this is one horse who is, is a very nice little mare, actually, um, used for sort of pony club and riding club, but she can't be, can she? She's not happy. Um, she can't really compete her job. Um, and no one's having a particularly nice time. No, she's not the world's worst head shaker, but she's in pain and she can't do the job she is intended to do. Now, if we pop a nose net on her, she's an awful lot better. So she has a little tick up this side. So she's not completely better, but I think she can do her pony club, riding club job like that. And I don't think from a welfare point of view, that's bad either. I think she's doing pretty well, actually. Now, having said I was only going to talk about published stuff, I'm being a bit naughty here because I'm adding in a face mask at this point. Now, this is not published, um, but there is a branch to the eyes. So sometimes covering the eyes as well, can help. Um, in my experience, not often on its own, but every now and again it does. Now, if it does work on its own, if you've got a top competition horse, you can actually compete with tinted contact lenses. You can only do that with a top one because they're about 350 quid a pop and the horses like to take them out. Um, but, um, but that is an option. So um, try a full face mask. It, it costs very little to try. And here is our little mare again. And now she's got a nose net and a face mask and she's as, as good as she'll get really. Um, and I think she's fine to do her job like that. No further, um, you know, no further work needed. So great if that works. Um, and here is one of our top competition horses there um, who is allowed to compete um, nationally with a face mask on, but not internationally. So that's the mask. What else is out there? Well, tablets. And that's one of your first go to's as a person um, with neuropathic pain. But there's not much in people. So there's a couple published. So ciproheptidine, which is a type of antihistamine, but it, it works quite uh, a lot on the brain uh, rather than. So it's, it's being used for that rather than being an anti-allergy. Um, and or carbamazepine, which is a drug um, that's it's actually, strictly speaking, anti-epileptic, but it is used for neuropathic pain in people. Um, those are both published but have very mixed results. So they'll work for the odd individual. They'll all not work for others. Sometimes they just work short term. Gabapentin is a drug um, that's used for neuropathic pain in people. Um, it is published for neuropathic pain, um, actually by a colleague of mine. Um, it's published for neuropathic pain in the horse, but not actually head shaking, which doesn't mean it's not used. It's just that no one's actually gone and looked at the data to find out how likely you are to get better on it. Um, even in people with neuropathic pain, these drugs have inconsistent results. So some individuals respond well to one drug, but not to another, even if they are otherwise exactly the same as another individual, the same condition, they're the same age, all of that sort of thing. Results can be short lived. Um, so sometimes response to medication can aid diagnosis. So even if the results are short lived, 
And some people have side effects such as drowsiness, although over time those can wear off. So um, potentially if you have a, a horse that is much better from its head shaking, but has side effects such as drowsiness, giving them obviously finding the lowest dose possible and giving them a bit of time, then those side effects may wear off. So what have we got in people? So inconsistent results will not been published. There's very, very little out there. Results may be short term. We don't even know how many tablets to give a horse. So we kind of go, well, a horse is seven people. Um, and then there's a few tablets left in the bottom, so we chuck them in as well. Um, we don't know how many tablets to give a horse. So we may well be treating them completely wrongly um, from a dose point of view. If they are drowsy, are they safe to ride and handle? Um, I think you've got to be very cautious, but I do think it's worth giving a bit of time. Some individuals respond well. I try two week trials, but I don't try this in every case because they can be prohibitively expensive, hundreds of pounds a week. Who can keep that up? Um, and you can't compete on them. So the few horses that can afford huge high doses of drugs um, would be your top competition horses, and then they can't compete. But you will get some horses that respond to affordable lower doses, and you'll only know that if you try. But when I do the two-week trials, I hit them on a high dose because if you do a low dose and they're no better then you don't know, do you? You don't know if it's because you've done a low dose or um, because you need to, you know, use a, um, a higher dose. So we, we start high. Um, magnesium and boron has been published recently. So supplementing magnesium and boron, they head shook a little bit less, um, but they were still head shaking. You can get a, perform a supplement in the US. Now in the UK, we can't feed boron um which is a bit of a random rule but but we can't so um we are working to make a better supplement um but uh, so, so contact us about that if you would like some information um and we are measuring magnesium and urine ph but we don't know if we're treating cause or effect so lots of people want to know about diet and supplements but there is really very little information out there yet and i think we don't know if we're treating cause or effect when we change diet and get a result Surgery wise, something that people quite often ask, what happens if I cut the nerve? Um, surely if the nerve, I want to stop the nerve um, firing, that's what I do. And that has been tried and it, it did work in a few horses, but it had lots of side effects. And then we developed that further um, as a surgery when I worked at Liverpool. But that was the same problem. We got a few horses better for sure, but we had significant side effects of rubbing their noses. And often those wore off, but um, four out of 58 horses we had to put to sleep because of that. So it is something that I would avoid doing now. Neuromodulation. I work with Southmead Hospital. Um, lots of possible treatments for people with similar neuropathic pain syndromes and no one good solution. So percutaneous electrical nerve stimulation is something that can be done under NICE guidelines for neuropathic pain in people. They know very little about it, but they do know it can work. What do you do? You put an electrically conductive probe over the nerve, you stimulate it at various frequencies and voltages, set period of time, and they say try three before you're sure it doesn't help you. Importantly, people say once the probe is in place, the procedure is quite pleasant and there are no reported side effects in people other than a bruise. So we decided to try. So this is Dude, one of my favourite horses in the world ever, um, showing that it was possible to do this procedure in a standing sedated horse. Um, and actually, in his case, possible to get him into remission for several years and, uh, and ongoing. And he's a lovely guy. So we did uh, so initially just in seven horses and we got five of those horses back to work. But the question was, for how long? So we then did a bigger study, 168 horses. 530 procedures. We had complications in 8%, all transient except one, and there's a question on that. So I think it's pretty safe. Those are our complications, pretty mild. Um, the one that is one to flag is 3.4%, so not very many, um, had a worsening of signs for a few days. We think the nerve is a bit annoyed um, and you could speed recover if you gave steroid. And if they happen, then we will give them steroid before we treat them next time. And again, we've only found that out by looking at the numbers. We also found out that you should do three procedures um, before you look at whether you've got better or not. How do they get better? Half of them will go into remission, so back to work at their previous level. How long for? Two days, which is pointless, um, two years and years. And there were just no predictors as to what would make a horse last a short period of time or a long period of time. Um, if you look at our graph there, 
Look at the middle line. Um, half of the horses go into remission. And as the line drops, that's them starting to head shake again. If they don't head shake for a year, that's 18% of horses don't head shake for a year. Chances are they will not start head shaking again. What happens if you're in the middle there? You start head shaking again after three months. Um, you treat them again, but just, just once. You need to do the three. Usually they get better and they get better for longer, but there is a little drop off. So there are no guarantees with this. Um, so th th there's no guarantees and there's no predictors. And I think at least until we know what causes it, we're going to struggle to treat it. Um, we don't know how neuromodulation works, but it is the safest procedure with the best um, results available for horses where a nose net doesn't work. Some of you will see electroacupuncture used, um, which was, was a sort of spin off of this. And it is cheaper and more accessible and it would be great if it was as effective. But all we've got is some work in six horses um, that found a two and a half week um, remission time. And these horses also needed face masks and nose nets. So the, the data comparing the two is not there at the moment. So the data is definitely suggesting that um, currently that um, the PENS neuromodulation is the, is the better treatment. And I'd like that to change because it would be more accessible and um, to owners and, and cheaper. But um, so far, it, it, it does look like we have the, the, the better procedure with neuromodulation. So what to do if your horse starts head shaking? Stay safe. That's the first important thing. If your horse is distressed at rest, call your vet out immediately. Otherwise, you're still going to call your vet, but observe, record and video first. So you've got more information to give them. Google with care. Do Google. You'll Google. That's normal. But Google with care. After discussion with your vet, you might want to do some or all or none. It depends on the case. Supplement magnesium. Try three different types of nose nap. They get lots of different varieties. So I think three is a sensible amount number to try. Try a face mask, potentially try butyl or an inhaled steroid. There's a lot more detail on our website. So go there. Come and see us. And we, take, we aim to get everything done in a day diagnostically. We can't promise that, but we will try. How you can help participate in clinical research. What does that mean for you? Mostly that is allowing us to ask you lots of questions about your horse and his or her signs. Give us access to your horse's case notes for research and allow us to contact you for follow up. We will do specific trials, but those will you'll have specific consent. Asked, so there'll be no surprises. The other way you can help is to support research financially. So we've got a few links there for donations to help fund um, a variety of projects, which we are hoping to get underway. Be sure as possible of a diagnosis. Concentrate, magnesium, nose net, face mask. Pens neuromodulation, and we need to know a lot more about the disease to move forward. Just to finish, one really bad head shaker. And here he is after his neuromodulation, and he has been in remission for years, um, which is it's always nice to finish on a positive. So there's contact, and I will hand um, over to Lee to run some questions. Sorry. I've been quite long. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, lots of questions coming in. Um, so I'm just going to work through them in order. There's there's quite a few about links um, between head shaking and allergies. So um, I will ask a few and hopefully that will answer um, the questions coming in. So the, the first is, do you have any research on the trigeminal nerve being affected um, by allergies? Uh, mine is diagnosed by vet with pollen allergies and only head shakes during the spring. Yeah, there's definitely something environmental. Definitely, definitely. But if you had, and if you can call allergy straightforward, because it isn't really, but if you have a straightforward allergy, you should at least be better, if not resolved, better with, ster uh, with steroids, more so than antihistamines in horses, because they have a slightly different immune system to us. But if you did steroids and antihistamines as well, you'd really expect to sort of knock an allergy on the head. And with a, and you might, if that's what your horse has, just a pollen allergy, fine. But they don't tend to head shake, they'll snort and sneeze. There is something though in the environment and potentially in pollen that is making this nerve get sensitized, but it's not a direct allergy. What the mechanism is and the link, I don't know, nobody knows. But I think there is one. Um, and it's finding what it is. And it won't be pollen for every horse. Um, it certainly isn't. But, but there is a link. 
if it was allergy, we'd be in a much better place because we could at least give them steroid. I mean, it's not a great place to be in, but it's better than where we are. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's, it's really important because there is something in the environment, definitely, definitely. But what and how is a big mystery. Uh, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, I've read some material online about high potassium levels in the grass, and some people have had success with this. Are there any studies that suggest high potassium levels may be a trigger? There's nothing published yet. Watch this space, though. Um, it is a difficult one. It, it, when you look, so they, particularly in California, they've been doing some work on this, um, and they've done a bit of work in New Zealand. Very different environments. In the UK, your highest potassium food is going to be ryegrass. It's almost impossible to avoid it. I don't know of anyone who can turn out on grass that's not ryegrass. You can go very careful and buy non-ryegrass hay, uh, or at least haylage. It's not easy, but it's possible. Um, but much harder to avoid ryegrass completely in the pasture. And what we, whereas it's much easier in California, where if you get any grass at all, um, and you can move them on to alfalfa, that's very high in calcium. Now, what are we doing there? Are we potentially manipulating magnesium? Possibly. We know there may be a role of magnesium. What we don't know is magnesium calms nerve firing down. So are we using the magnesium and lowering potassium and all of this stuff as a treatment? Or is the high potassium causing, a, causing it? We we don't know yet. And that's one thing, again, when we look at blood on these horses that we look for, and actually they're often normal. Um, kidneys are very good. You just wee, you wee out too much stuff. Um, but I think it is a watch this space. I don't have the answer yet. And, and hopefully, but hopefully someone will um, soon. And I think it, it is a watch this space, but I'm, it's very frustrating. There's actually no answer to give yet on what's the right thing to do. Um, so it's frustrating at this stage. Uh, okay. Um slightly different tack. My dressage, dressage horse tilts his head. Is that connected? He head shakes badly out hacking near woods if it's sunny. One th that, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting one. And that's the kind of case where, where possibly a nerve block to the face would help um, try and find out if that's the problem. The most common cause, as you'll all know, for a dressage horse tilting the head is not using the hind end in quite quite evenly um that's the commonest reason but obviously you've got a horse then that, that potentially is a trigeminal mediated head shaker when they're in a particular environment so that would potentially be a horse that you could nerve block um being aware that if the horse is no better you might be no further forward but if your horse stops head tilting then you know um another option which i suspect you tried is a nose net in the in the arena um it, if that helps them um but that might be one to try but D yeah difficult I mean I, I guess the other reason is the other thing is to look orthopedically and that a very mild change in push from behind is the commonest reason for a horse to tilt its head but actually then you could say oh if the horse looks completely fine orthopedically maybe it is the head shaking so um a, a bit of looking at the whole horse and and working together on that one and actually that that's one thing that one thing that I often do when I see cases and and, and why I, I need to see them in a hospital environment I don't like to see them on my own I like to be able to go, oh, this is a bit different. I want someone from orthopedics to come and have a look for 10 minutes. Um, I want someone from dentistry to come and have a look. And, and that's where I think it's really important that you know, it's not uncommon for me to book cases for two vets, um, if the history suggests that. Um, and otherwise, I like to be able to, to grab someone when they're busy and go, can you come and have a look? Um, I think that's really important. You've got to look at the whole horse. Thanks. Um, my horse seems fine in the indoor school, but bad out hacking. Should I stop hacking or can I give him drugs 30 minutes before I hack? Um, and within competitions with draw periods, obviously. You can definitely, <clears throat> you can definitely try. Um, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's not published at all, but it, it's, it's there, isn't it? That some horses do it outside and not in the arena. And I have a nice video of a lovely big uh, show hunter who, I had him in the indoor and he wasn't shaking and I took him outside in the field and he was shaking and I took him in and he stopped shaking and I did it multiple times. Um, and again, that tends to fit with trigeminal mediated head shaking. So options, it's nice to hack them equally if they're in pain. Um, it's really not, so not, not ideal. Um, and we may have to think of something else. Can you give them drugs? Yes. Um, are they likely to work difficult because some of them will need to get blood levels up before they're of use? So what I would suggest doing is try, um, obviously talk to your vets, 
but try the high dose for two weeks. Now, if that doesn't work, a pulse treatment's not gonna work. If that does work, try and find the lowest dose and then try pulsing it and seeing if it works. Um, and that will be the only way of knowing it. it will depend on the individual horse. It might be quite an expensive hack. <laughs> um, a few questions about nose nets. So um, you, you've already mentioned that there are several types available. So I'm guessing there's probably not one particular type that, that you would particularly recommend. Um, and also, should they be wet? They, it depends on the individual horse. And that's where, I mean, you could literally try nose nets for the rest of your life. The problem with trying nose nets forever is it can cost you a fortune. And if, you know, at some point you've got to say this isn't, isn't working, which is why I suggest three. Three is an arbitrary number. You can try five, you can try one. Um, but I think don't, don't leave the horse in pain for a year trying different nose nets, which I'm sure none of you would do. But that's why I tend to say three. Why do I say three? Because they, the different nose nets tend to fall into three different types if you like so you've got the competition legal one which is the first one to try if you want to compete because actually sometimes finding out that your horse doesn't head shake with something that you can't compete with is actually just potentially more depressing um so try the the it's normally like equilibrium is the one but there's standard rules and you check your own um british dressage or british eventing or whoever you're, you're going with check the rules try that net now, if that doesn't work, I tend to say try one of the really hard ones. There are some really um, some ones with a really firm um, sort of nose plate. Um, and then you've got others that cover the whole of the muzzle as well. So those are your kind of three basic types. This is, again, where Facebook forums, again, be cautious on them. But they're really useful because don't spend money. Just ask them on there. Someone will post you one um, and try it. And if it doesn't work, you can post it to someone else. Um, rather than you spending a fortune, not that they're hugely expensive, but why spend money on a trial if you don't have to? So, so that's where I am with nose nets. Um, if they tend to get wet just with lots of slobber, um, but whether if someone finds them more useful wet, they, it's, it's worth a try. But you'll know quickly whether it's working. You don't have to try for ages. Um, thank you. Um, my horse head shakes in spring and autumn. He also head shaked when he was five when his canines were coming through and stopped when the vet cut a hole for them to come through. His seasonal head shaking appears, um, his seasonal head shaking happens a lot next to crops. Mm -hmm. um, could something we now spray on crops cause head shaking? Well, this is one of the one of the interesting environmental things, isn't it? Um, and that's one of, I'd love to know if in the developing world where things are different um whether those horses have trigeminal mediated head shaking i mean more than just crop spring what about pollution and some places are worse some are better and um, different pollutants is any of that involved i i don't know um but it, it's not a you know it's not a crazy thought at all that because there is something out there which may to make it even more complicated maybe different between different individuals it's likely to be different between different individuals but something out there if it was a direct toxin we'd see a problem when we looked at the nerve down a microscope and we don't um but there is something happening um thank you um is there any correlation between bridal stroke nose band fit or type to cause a trigeminal irritation no it's a great it's a great question it's one that's asked a lot and actually if we'd found damage to the nerve when you looked under the microscope um, particularly if that was where the nose band sits and you think, oh, this is something we've made, right? Um, and every now and again, you'll get a horse that has damage to the nerve. Usually his friend has clonked him in the face um, and they may well head shake and nose rub, but they will rub just that one side that's got damaged. Um, so if it was the bridle, you would see nerve damage, compression, inflammation, something on the nerve, and we don't. So I don't think it's a nose band. Conversely, you will find some horses that go better or worse in a noseband which makes sense so some horses um, and again it's easy to try and you can you know you don't have to try for very long to know if it's working some horses like a really wide thick noseband that's done up quite tight why because that's effectively rubbing the nerve you know if you you know if you press your elbow after you um you know and clutch it after you've banged it that helps about as much as rubbing it so some horses will will find that helpful other horses will find that extremely unpleasant because they're nervous sensitized. And so having a tight nose band 
is horrible for them, but you'll know really quickly um, and, and your own horse will tell you. Thank you. Um, somebody here has just made the point they found a suede fly fringe instead of a nose a uh, nose band or nose that has resolved my boy's head shaking or, which was mild but 99 percent, which is another tip Ab absolutely um, and again that's when it's frustrating that you couldn't compete with that um yeah and I, I i certainly um would like the rules to be easy and i hate the fact they can't show with a nose net um i, I think that's how is it improving their performance i don't i don't Anyway, yeah. that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, my horse has had all of the treatments, checks, nets, drugs, etc., for uh, TMH and has cost a fortune, but he only reacts and very violently when eating long fibre. Is this something you've heard of? Um, the nerve block showed pain present, and I think he feels shocked when his nose touches the hay and he grabs it. Is this not TMP? It, it's really difficult. We've got horses that do that. Um, it may it may just be a form of trigeminal mediated head shaking. And I've certainly have have seen horses that do that. Usually we find dental pathology and now we don't in all of them. Are what where do those horses fit on the spectrum? Um, I don't know. Is it that we just don't have the good enough diagnostics yet? We can't really MRI horses' heads. Um, every now and again, we can. Um, it depends on the size of the horse's head and the length of the neck. But most horses, we can't MRI. And we would, as a person, that's probably what you'd have. And that picks up more problems than CT than in a soft tissue um, sense. So it may just be that we don't have the right test to get quite the right diagnosis. And so our closest is it's trigeminal mediated. It's, it is a hard one. I, I don't know. If I don't find dental pathology in those horses, it's very hard to know how to manage them. Thank you. There's a few um, questions coming in about connections between, are, well, are there connections between vaccines and head shaking, Lyme's disease and head shaking? Um, I, I, are you able to give any uh, comment on those or connections between those kind of things? Only that I think they're really good things to think of. We don't have, we don't have the answers. We know that there is something that makes it happen. We don't know how. And it's something that they are exposed to. They're not born like that. And they will be exposed to vaccines for sure. But obviously every other horse is exposed to vaccines. But there is something that perhaps works with an individual horse's genetics. Now, whether that's some kind of, you know, it's something in the environment which would include any kind of medication or anything you're exposed to at all, right? Um, and we don't know what that link is. So I certainly would definitely vaccinate all my own horses, um, no, no question. Um, Lyme's disease is not that, well, it's, it's common and not common, which is a, a, another webinar, which I won't bore you with, but um, in some parts of the world, it's much less common and we still see head shaking. So I think you can probably rule that one out um, unless it's an individual, you know, individual reaction. Lots of horses get vaccinated. I don't think it's vaccines. I think it's more to do with the world around um, and, and, you know, pollen and food and that kind of thing, but I don't know, you know, and I think we've got to keep an open mind. Um, we, we, should, we will find it one day. And I, and I do want to do a project on um, RNA expression at iron channels, um, which is again, something else I can bore you with for ages. Um, but I wonder if that would tell us what's different between a horse that's a head shaker and a horse that isn't. Okay, thank you. Um, if your horse stops head shaking with steroids, prednisolone, would you suggest that keep, would you suggest just keeping them on steroids or is there anything else you can do? This is a mare who head shakes year round, but is worse in summer. Certainly if they respond to steroid, then whoop, whoop, hooray, and they're not trigeminal mediated. There was a massive study from the US that treated horses with steroid and nobody got better. And that makes sense because your steroid treats inflammation and allergy and the nerve is normal, but the study in the US was done before we knew the nerve was normal. So there's another reason. Um, so there is inflammation um, or allergy likely, those are gonna be the most likely reasons why a horse would stop shaking on steroid. But you don't, it depends on the problem, not all inflammation and allergy needs to be treated all the time on steroid, um, some does. Sometimes you can drop the doses, um, you can drop the frequency, sometimes you can stop for considerable periods of time and the inflammation stays quiet before you have to start again. So 
if, if I use my own analogy, which is, you'll find it funny, two horses, um, I use a steroid nasal spray to help me. Otherwise, I sneeze a lot near horses. And if I don't, if I'm not around horses for a while, um, which to be fair, doesn't happen that often, but if I'm not around horses for a while, I'll have to use it. I, I come off it and give myself a rest. And then I'll start to use the spray twice a day um, for a couple of weeks. And then I'll go to once a day and then I'll go every other day. And then I keep it at every other day um, because I have tried coming off it before and I last for about a week and then I start sneezing again. So you, you just have to try. Um, the only way of predict, you know, there is no way of predicting it. It's got to be your individual horse that tells you the answer. Thank you. Um, somebody says, what if your horse is better in work? Um, so I'm guessing, you know, obviously they, they're sitting head shaking when the horse is is not being worked, um, and but they're better in work. Usually something different other, other than um, I have had some very sort of top competition horses who, I guess it's the equine equivalent of cognitive behavioural therapy. They kind of, they get the game face on, the tap goes on and they cope with it. And But they might just be worse when you take the bridle off. So there's a few horses like that um, that don't, don't quite you know buck the trend what you might find is if they're flopping about on the lunge that they still head shake and it's only when they know that they're working now um and there is definitely and that's not it's, it's not crazy at all there's a, you know sometimes you get a horse very excited they don't head shake sometimes they are much worse if they're upset brain chemicals are involved in all of those states so that it, it's not there is something going on in the brain beyond what we understand and, and i just can't give the answers unfortunately okay but it's not it's not crazy stuff at all <laughs> um could it be aggravated or triggered by flexion as well as environmental factors it shouldn't be um the nerve if they're trigeminal mediated the nerve is just inside the head so it goes as you saw on that picture it's the yellow one it goes from the nose to the brain so it it shouldn't be affected by flexion. Um, and again, if it was some kind of pressure damaging the nerve, we'd have seen that when we looked at the nerve under a microscope. So um, I would be looking at another cause. Um, again, an option is to do a nerve block and rule out the face and then see if they're still shaking. You think, well, maybe it's neck um, would be your next go-to place. Equally, if they don't stop head shaking, you're not further forward if they stop head shaking and you're sure it's the face then somehow it, it may be but you might be looking at something different I, I suspect that'd be more likely okay thanks um and a couple of people have mentioned uh cranio uh, craniosacral therapy or um cranial osteopathy um have you got any information on whether that therapy is effective or works i think there's a lot on the internet nobody's published it and for any of these other treatments what people need to do is be sure their horse or as sure as possible the horse is trigeminal mediated for starters and not just go my horse you know this, this horse shakes um so try and get the diagnosis and then you need to look at does it work and what are your criteria for does it work so there's a 30 percent placebo effect in interpreting whether or not your horse has got better from head shaking which is why in my studies i have looked at whether horses have gone back to work at their previous level, not whether or not we think they're better, because we want to think they're better. And that's a massive bias. And actually one study, which I have got um, uh, permission to, to get on with, and just waiting for um, a bit of the, the funding to come through, but that's been agreed, is to try and objectively evaluate severity of head shaking. So effectively, you could put a measurer, a measuring device on the horse um, before a treatment and get to know how they are normally, and then put the sort of Fitbit type thing on the horse afterwards and see if they're really better. And that's what's lacking in anything that's out there on the internet. Are you sure that they are a trigeminal mediated head shaker and are they really better? And nobody has got those studies out there. I don't know how they would necessarily work for trigeminal mediated head shaking, but if someone can give the data, fantastic. But I, I, sus I suspect if they're truly trigeminal mediated, it won't help. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'm always open to being proved wrong because I, I would love them to get better. But but no one's done that work. Thank you. Uh, my horse lolls his tongue always out to the right. Um, why? And is this connected to his head shaking? That's, a, that's again, that's a really tricky one. So, I mean, horses do. We've all ridden them. Um, that their tongue <laughs> sticks out. And you're like, put that back in. The dressage judges don't like it. Um, 
but they don't necessarily have a problem. They just like to stick it out or, you know, what they lick their lips and flop, flop about and they like to do it in the stable. You'll get others that do that because they do have an issue. And that's where you, you know, as, such as, as, as the, um, the other question about the horse tipping, tilting the head on, on, in a dressage arena, I think that's the case of looking at the whole horse. Can you find a problem? Um, CT scans would tell you if there's a problem with that connection to the tongue, for sure. Um, but otherwise, some of them will do that because you know, a bit like the head tilting as, as a way to, to move their weight slightly one way or the other. So, yeah, you have to look at the whole horse, really. Amazing. Thanks. Um, and somebody's asking about the uh, use of magnesium supplement. Should it always be trialled with boron? Well, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if we could get it? Now, the boron is just there to make the horse take up more magnesium more easily. So the boron itself is not important. The boron is just there because it makes it easier for the horse to absorb magnesium. Now, so the studies were done with magnesium and boron. Um, and no studies have been done with just magnesium, which is frustrating because in the UK and the EU, we aren't allowed to feed boron, which is a really random rule because there's no reason not to feed boron. It's just that no one's done any paperwork. And the paperwork, I did look, the paperwork is not something that's achievable by an individual. <laughs> um, so we are stuck with just magnesium. Now, does that matter? Um, how much magnesium is safe to give? If the boron is making your magnesium easier to absorb, do we um, counteract that by just giving more magnesium um, than you would to a normal horse? Um, maybe, but there can be problems of giving too much magnesium. So one of the things that I, I want to, to find out is to start with, and this is, what, this is why research is so slow, but to start with, all our horses get their blood magnesium measured. Are they low? Um, and then the next question is, well, if you supplement them, where does it get to? Are they harder to get magnesium into than a normal horse? At which point you can safely give them more. Or actually, we, do we need to titrate it against individual horses? Or does it not really make a difference? And, and I don't know. And that's a very long term. You know, that'll take a long time to find out. Um, so, But the start point is, where is magnesium in the blood of a of a head shaker compared to a, a non head shaking horse is is that low and that's where we are at the moment so this is what will take so long because that's what we've got to find out first um so make them as magnesium as you can magnesium as you can safely which i think means you just at the moment can't use more than it says on the packet but that may change and and this is where we're working with the supplement manufacturer but it is very very slow because we can't they will make bespoke stuff for us um, but they can't add in the boron and we don't know how much magnesium is safe to give. So we need to find out if tri trigeminal mediated head shakers have low magnesium to start with. Um, that's that's the, the first bit to know what we can do safely. So it will take a long time. OK, thanks. Um, and you, I think you've already mentioned about Googling stuff and Facebook pages and, and something. There's another question here. Um, I'm confused about alfalfa. Um, most head shaking posts on a Facebook page for head shakers indicate absolutely no alfalfa is to be fed. Yet I worry about the lack of calcium if that's the case. Can you please um, speak about this? Thank you. I think that's where we, we don't have any published data. And it very much depends where you are in the world, um, because in a UK population, most people don't feed a significant amount of alfalfa and don't think twice about it. Um, other parts of the world that maybe don't have lots of grass will feed predominantly alfalfa. So it's a, um, and so, you know, sort of parts of the Middle East will do that. It's, it, it's, so it will vary where you are as to what other sources of nutrition your horse is getting. We do think there's a way of potentially managing some individual horses by changing diet, but we don't know very much about that, which makes it very hard to actually give anybody any advice on what to do. So you have to try for your own horse. But if you are worried about lack of a particular nutrient, the way to go forward is to give them a feed balancer and kind of go, I'm going to play around with different hays and different grasses, but I know that twice a day you get enough of, of everything um, to be okay. And I think that's a sensible approach to take. It, there's, there's not the data there to know if that's quite enough. Again, you can always get blood levels measured um, if you want to be sure. Um, 
but we get yeah, it's really hard to know what to tell you to do diet wise when we just don't know and we don't know if we're fixing the problem or just using the diet as a treatment but it is something that i think will evolve over the next few years and we may have some information soon um, well soon in a research sense not very soon in a horse in a sense which is really frustrating when you ride a horse and you want the treatment now um thank you um has anyone ever looked at electric fencing and linked and whether this is linked to head shaking and might be a trigger of sensitivity of the nerves? Yeah, not, not to my knowledge, but we know that, I mean, the, elect, the neuromodulation is sending a signal up the nerve and trying to change the way it, um, it functions. Um, and there's very few horses that have never seen an electric fence. Again, it, it's, that's a difficult one. It certainly isn't something that's physically damaged the nerve. And I guess in the history from people, they don't tend to say, the classic is I was out riding and I think a bee flew up his nose because he started going crazy. Not I brought him in from the field um, and I couldn't get near his head. And, and you all know how they are the day that they zap themselves. They're a bit freaked out, aren't they? Um, and people don't then tend to say, oh, he zapped himself. And then and then he became a head shaker. So I would hope not. Um, but yeah, we, we, we don't know. Um, just a, a few few more questions. Uh, my gelding started head shaking a couple of months ago. We're working through the diagnosis process and nose nets and supplements are next. Uh, my vet injected the nerve with steroid and that didn't work. His symptoms happen only under saddle. He shakes his head intermittently and lots of snorting and a very itchy nose. Uh, he started to get fussy in the rainback. Should we avoid the rainbacks until we can get him more comfortable? He does this more with me than my trainer. I guess if he doesn't do it on the lunge, I would hope he's not trigeminal mediated. Um, and that might fit with, obviously you have to, to sit um, to go backwards and engage. Although potentially your trainer can get more engagement than you. So they're actually weirdly, if it is a musculoskeletal thing, they may be worse with a trainer than with you on. So difficult, difficult to know. Um, I, I mean, I suspect avoiding something that brings it on seems sensible. Um, but I think, yes, you, you seem very much in, in the journey currently of, of diagnostics, which will then help. Uh, OK, um, mine is severe during June, July every year and completely stops in autumn and winter. Nose nets and antihistamines do not work. He head shakes and sharply jolts when on the yard, hacking, lunging and schooling, but perfectly happy out in the field and won't head shake. The head shaking stresses him out, makes him very tense and seems to make him worse as we continue. Does his stress levels contribute to this or can make it worse? I think there is. I think there is. And you'll often find people say, if my horse is upset, that they'll shake more. And this is where we're talking brain chemicals, you know, that, and also just your state of mind. And we'll all know pain is very, very, it's a fascinating thing. And, and you can only assume what other people feel. But we've all been there that you are in a situation where you really hurt yourself, but you don't feel it yet. Um, I mean, certainly my own uh, broken <laughs> broken leg, which was catastrophically um, fractured. I, I knew I banged it, um, but it wasn't until I, 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 I'd got taken to hospital in an ambulance, but I insisted on them taking me to minor injuries. Like it didn't hurt. Um, and they were all running around going, well, you, you know, once they'd x-rayed it, they were like, oh gosh, you need, you know, morphine and gas and air and stuff. And it was only when I started to realize what had happened. I was like, oh my God, this is really painful. So your the way your head is affects how you deal with pain and how you feel it. So yes, I think how you are does change things, um, but we don't know enough about it. But I, I think then the classic one is um, something I, was, I, I heard on a new radio interview where the gentleman in question had been... Um, he was 14 and he was showing off to a girl that he really fancied and he fell off his bike and his broke his collarbone um and he didn't feel it for about two hours um because he was you know a bit wound up um and and we see that horses break their legs racing and they don't necessarily show it till they they finish um i, I think that it's really interesting how how pain works which is why sometimes behavioral therapy works in people um and it does work more than just teaching you to deal better with your pain. You, you do actually feel it less if you can train your brain. Thank you. Um, and then one that was submitted by email. Why does my horse head shake in just the rain when the rain hits his face, but I can touch his face without any reaction? Oh, that Sounds is... like he just doesn't like the rain. 
there is, do you know, there is a small group of head shakers that shake in rain, but if you put them under a sprinkler and lunge them under a sprinkler, which is a very wet thing to try and do, but I have been there, <laughs> they, they don't head shake. Now, so it isn't the rain, but it is the rain, but it isn't the rain. You'll get these horses that will start head shaking. You know when the weather changes just before it starts to rain and they'll start to head shake then? The atmosphere, atmospheric pressure changes. I've no idea if it's that. Is it? That, but there is, there is a, a small group of horses and they, they're an unlucky group because I haven't had good success treating them. But they do that. They'll do it in the rain. They don't tend to do it if you lunge them under a sprinkler and some of them will start doing it when they know rain is coming. And it, it can be hugely difficult for them and for the owner. You'll have these poor owners who sort of run home from work to pull their horse in from the field because then suddenly it looks like it's going to rain um, and their whole lives end up revolving around looking at the weather. Um, and I can't answer what's different about those horses but there is something different and and this is where I think we're unlikely to get a one-size-fits-all treatment um a bit about more about nose bands have any specific types of nose bands proved to be better or worse for head shakers um are there any nose bands I should avoid no I don't think so so um one of my studies we looked at we asked people what they did um treatment wise and I, I have a whole lists of tables of different treatment um of what people have tried and they've tried all sorts um and nothing stands out we did various statistics on it nothing stands out um as being effective or not now you might get something that works for your individual or doesn't work for your individual um but there is nothing that comes across the board either to make it better or worse I mean, it's not, it doesn't, it covered, covered a huge number of horses, but we looked at, at um, we did it out of the 168 that we looked at. So this is a reasonable number. Um, you mentioned a butte trial and we have um, a person listening from Denmark and she just wanted clarification as to what butte is. I'm not a vet. Oh, so in I Denmark, I've worked in Sweden. In Denmark, you'll be using probably Masacam, Meloxicam. Um, it's just a painkiller. And, and in the UK, we tend to still use butte, but much of mainland Europe doesn't. Um, um, but the, certainly my go-to in Sweden was, was Metacam. It just Thank appeared. you. Um, my pony can get so bad that he will stop in canter and trot just to rub his nose. Is this common in idiopathic head shaking? Yes. Um, ridden and on the lunge. Common and terrifying. Um, and you'll get some of them that just then won't go forward again ever. They'll just, well, obviously not ever, but they'll just stand still and go, I can't go because if I go, it's going to hurt. Um, but yes, then I mean they're, they're often just not safe to. Even if you didn't think about the welfare aspect, it is not safe to ride a horse that's going to suddenly stop because they have to rub their nose. And there's nothing they can not being naughty. Um, they they have to do it. Um, a couple of people have said they've been advised to feed salt to their head shaker. Another one says a metprazole. Um, have you got any comments on why that might be, or whether there's any suggestion that they would help? Salt is a hard one. That's all tied in with obviously salt is sodium chloride that affects changes your potassium, your magnesium, your calcium. So maybe, maybe um, there is not actually much evidence that if you feed salt to a horse, their sodium levels go up because they're just very good at weeing it out. Um, but it is a, it's a, it goes into the watch this space with the feeding and electrolytes box that hopefully will something will come out of that we can actually give you some more concrete information. The omeprazole is a treatment for gastric ulcers, so. Um, often horses will get gastric ulcers because they're really upset. So it's not wrong that a horse that head shakes may have ulcers um, and the link between the two, which came first. Um, but if the, head, the ulcers came first, then the head shaking will not be trigeminal mediated. But if you have trigeminal mediated head shaking, you may be stressed and miserable and develop gastric ulcers. Thank you. Um, my horse is pretty severe, but completely stops with one cc of I am um asepromo asepromazine is that right yep. <laughs> she's still very alert and quite rideable but of course not legal to compete um why do you think this works well it's it's again it's looking at brain chemicals aren't you um so it's it's a sedate it's a sedative and it works centrally and the other drugs we talked about all work on the brain as well so the ones that have been used work on the brain so if that can change the way your horse interprets the nerve firing, if that's the diagnosis, then that's how it's working, although we don't fully understand that, but it is massively frustrating um, that you can't compete in it. I do understand you can't. I mean, it is a sedative. 
Um, but there, there may be a different diagnosis and that's, that's, that's a hard one. But um, if it works for your horse, that's great. But it is a real shame that you can't compete. Um, my horse had THO diagnosed by CT and had uh, keratohyoidectomy surgery in August 2020. And although head shaking symptoms changed um, or improved, um, it didn't stop. Should I still try the other possible things to help as I want to make her as comfortable as possible? had repeat CT and the other side was normal. Yeah, I think I think that's where it, you know, it's difficult to perhaps comment on that case without looking at the images. Um, but treatment for THO is difficult and often, often doesn't work. I can't remember what the statistics is, but you're about as likely to work as you are to not work. So is it that there's more than one thing going on? Is it that the THO treatment hasn't worked? Is it that the THO was a red herring? That's that's difficult to know for that individual case without looking at that one completely. But you've done the sensible thing, which is the repeat CT, because that's where I'd go next um, and see what's what's happened. OK, I'm going to do two more questions. Otherwise, we're going to be here forever. <laughs> and I'm sure people want to go. Um, the first one is my pony had a butte trial and was 70 percent improved. He is still on butte with the same improvement, but um, still head shaking. Uh, more side to side head shaking. The vet is recommending a CT scan. What do you think? Um, again, with those, I'm really happy to talk to vets and watch videos. Um, so always happy to input on those. It's, it sounds less likely to be trigeminal mediated and more likely to be some kind of normal pain, uh, which is invariably a good thing. The hard bit then is finding where in the horse does the normal pain come from? Um, and that's really, really hard. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly happy to chat, chat through um, that that one and watch some videos and see what's the problem with. There's lots of different things you can do next. It's working out which one is most likely to give you the answer. But also being aware that if you see T and that's normal, you know, maybe the next thing you do is a bone scan. And actually, if the bone scan finds something, you wish you'd done it the other way around. But you don't know till afterwards. So you do have to sort of do a best guess on which is the right way to spend the money next um, and hope that you kind of luck out. But that there may be an element of we have to run all the tests before we finally get the answer on test number four. And we wish we'd done test number four first, but we we didn't um, with the best intention. If you see what I mean. I know, and we often end up in that situation. Tricky one. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And then finally, uh, what would be the best way, best way to manage a head shaker that needs the exercise due to being a good doer and is a lambing risk? Really hard. You know, I think if you can find a situation where they don't shake, so perhaps in an indoor arena, which you may not have access to because, you know, we don't all. Um, but that that kind of situation might work. And actually, having said that, we don't all have access to an indoor arena. I do have an owner and it wouldn't, wouldn't suit everybody but um, loaned her horse out to one of the agricultural colleges because they had a big indoor and he was absolutely fine indoors and just couldn't go outside, but then could still have a pretty normal life. I mean, he couldn't go out in the field and have a, a lovely time um, for part of the year like most horses, but he could he could be a horse. Um, you know, in, in some cases you do end up in a situation where you just, they don't respond to any treatment and you just can't manage them um, and you do end up looking at euthanasia and that'll vary in on individuals but there is a it is always there um head shaking is a horrible disease and a lot of horses with it do end up being euthanized for a whole range of reasons um and that's, that's why we need to get better at it thank you um and just to say there have been a few questions about costs of workups investigations treatments uh, and so on so i think the best thing that people can do is speak to their vets um, and uh, or, and get in touch with the hospital, um, the B&W hospital, um, to talk through the costs because they, they vary depending on various factors. Um, I know, you know that the, right? one of the great things about the, the hospital there is they'll do a, a package price. So at least you know you know what you're gonna your bill's gonna be at the end when you come in the door. You know you're not sat there going oh god what's that gonna test gonna cost. Um, yeah. You know and that, and, that, and that's really um, helpful. And I I found that having um, had to seek some private treatment for my fracture. I'm really, I didn't want the cheapest surgeon in the world. Um, I don't want the most expensive. I didn't want the cheapest surgeon in the world, but I wanted to know when I woke up from my surgery that it was going to cost what it was going to cost, not, oh God, they're giving me another drug. What does that cost? 
Um, or, or if, did it run on another hour? Um, how much is that going to be now? Um, you're much more in control if you know what it's going to cost. And, and that's something that I've, I think they do really. I've always worked, wanted to like liked to work with package pricing. And that's what they do as a standard anyway. Yeah, amazing. So, and the phone number that is there on that last slide that's still on the screen. Um, so um, if you call that number, you'll get through to the referrals team um, and they'll talk you through it. Okay, well, finally, thank you very much, Veronica, for your time this evening. Um, I think it's we're getting some really great feedback coming through on the chat and the uh, Q&A, so um, that's great. And just to remind people that there are two other video presentations that you've recorded um, on the YouTube channel, so um, people can, can go and watch those. So thank you very much. Thank you for watching it. Yeah.